All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Skeptic Fence Show. Uh, guys, real quick, uh, tonight's guest is a really cool guest, and I'm um, looking forward to uh, chatting with him uh, tonight. It's Raphael Letaster. He's actually the author of There Was No Jesus, There Is No God. Um, another thing I wanted to let you guys know also that we're, we're, we're doing some new technical stuff, some background stuff, and tonight you will be able to see the improvements for the Skeptic Fence Show, uh, better graphics, uh, you'll see intros to our new segments and just uh, intros to our, you know, even our news topics. And, uh, you know, we got uh, two new hosts that I'm going to get into a little bit here. But, um, yeah, just all around better visual and audio quality. And, and like, you, you will see the difference tonight. So uh, when it comes to the technical aspect tonight, I may be a little rusty on this new setup. So uh, please forgive me if I make a mistake or two. But uh, all in all, it's going to look really cool tonight. So, um uh, Another note I want to make is uh, the website is still under construction. We're going to get there. I did add a few things to it, and I'm coming up with some ideas that I'm going over with uh, Negation. And uh, uh, and also Matthew, I will be going over a few things with him too, and also Cocktopus Prime and also Taldega Tom, uh, which is our moderator on our forums, Taldega Tom. But uh, yeah, we'll get there. It, it should be a huge improvement you know, in the next two weeks before our next show, so uh, hang in there. Also, make sure you sign up on the Skeptic Fence Show Facebook, um, you know, our YouTube uh, channel, and also on our forums. All the links that pertain to what I just said are down below, right below uh, on Vaughn Live TV. So you'll see that in the description box down below. So what I really want to do right now is welcome our two uh, new hosts uh, to the Skeptic Fence Show roster, and I'm pretty excited to have... Uh, uh, first off, uh, TJ, a.k.a. you guys know him on YouTube as Cocktopus Prime. Uh, he will be our host for our new segment, which is the Cuda Report. And uh, that name uh, was uh, created by Tal Degatama, our moderator on our forum. So uh, that's going to be an incredible segment. A little entertainment value uh, for the Skeptic Fence Show. And you guys are going to really like that. So... Uh, we will also play a video so you understand why we named it the Cooter Report. So when you hear the word Cooter, it's not really what you probably would think maybe with the word Cooter, you know? Yeah, I mean, so it's it's not that, but uh, some of you guys or many of you guys will probably understand what that means. Um, and last but not least, uh, I would like to uh, welcome our second, or at least our, I should say our second new host of the show, and that's uh, Matthew Steele. He's going to be our new co-host. And uh, Matthew uh, Steele, uh, welcome to the Skeptic Fence Show roster, man, in your new position on the show, man. How you doing? Very happy to be here. Very happy. Um, I'm really looking forward to where the show is going now. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, hey, just so good. everybody knows, I, I'm having some technical difficulties at home, so I'm not able to connect through Skype. I'm just going to be talking through my phone, so I hope the, the quality is all right. Negation of P? I'm here. How's everybody doing? Number one, I am excited as well for Matthew to be along. He definitely brings a lot to the show, and I've we've been wanting him to oh, be on for a while, so I'm glad we roped him in <laughs> um the other thing as usual guys remember we will be reposting this to itunes um on the skeptic fence web page as well and youtube it may also go to a couple of other websites um, just remember by participating in the show you're agreeing to allow us to rebroadcast your likeness and of course you're not going to file a dmca or ask for compensation or pursue any other actions against the show or anyone that appears on the show so with all that crap out of the way why don't we go ahead and hit it because we got a lot to do to today yeah we do and i just seen our guest uh, log into skype so uh, we'll be bringing him in here Raphael Letaster. we'll be bringing him in here probably like around 10 o'clock in about an hour or so uh maybe actually within 45 minutes maybe so we're gonna get through this uh new segment pretty quickly so uh let's get to our uh, first topic here which is about uh basically uh new jersey being a uh, 14th state that actually uh legalized uh same-sex marriage so uh let's get into this because uh we got a little bit to talk about when it comes to the same-sex uh, marriage issue so state in the U.S. to legalize same-sex marriage, and couples were getting married as early as 12.01 a.m. Monday morning uh, to take advantage of this new law. Now, originally, Chris Christie was planning on challenging this law, but he decided not to, which is probably a good way to go about it. Um, and it's exciting news. It shows you that there's more progress when it comes to gay rights, but we still have a long way to go. 14 states is nothing. You know, we, we need to go further and make sure that every state gives gay couples the right to get married 
Uh, it was a big decision by Chris Christie because he wanted to fight. The, uh, he took the case to the New Jersey Supreme Court. After he had court. fought it. Yeah, he had fought it. It yeah. was already filed. The appeal was already filed. He withdrew the appeal. Mm -hmm. um, that's a decision. That to mean that you know everything Chris Christie does now is going to be looked at in the prism of uh, presidential politics. Yeah. So he's making a decision. I, I probably in the sense that uh, I admire it from a tactical point of view. That rather than Mitt Romney trying frantically to convince people on the right that he's somebody else, yeah. Chris Christie is saying uh, they think I'm a moderate. Uh, I'm just going to do the moderate thing. He said, yeah. I don't want gay people to get married. I think it's the wrong decision. But the, the, the court ruled this way. The Supreme Court was going to uphold it. This is a waste of time. Let's go. He's they never going to get the, the people law. in the party who are vehemently right. anti-gay right. marriage. Right. So right. It, it, it's a smart political, very And he may think that, and, but come general election, if I can manage to win the damn thing in the front, they'll come to me. Yeah, anyway. they'll come to me. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a really smart strategy as well, especially because if you are a Republican and you want any chance to win a presidential election, I think you have to be moderate. I mean, especially, I mean, who knows if he'll actually make it through the primaries, but I, I think that Chris Christie is one of the few Republicans out there, even though I disagree with him on a lot of things, the few Republicans out there where I look at him and I say, eh, the lesser of two evils. Not so bad when it comes to certain issues. You know what I mean? And, and when it comes to millennials or when it comes to maybe libertarians um, that are progressive on social issues if Republicans want to stand a chance with them they need to be a little more liberal with social issues that's what killed them during the last election yeah he's got to take a lead on that immigration and it'll be interesting to see how he reacts to whatever immigration law comes out of Washington you know, he doesn't unlike everybody he appears to like governing yeah which is right now the modern breed of Republican they got no interest in governing yeah. Uh, and Christie, you know, Christie likes meeting with, he'd like meeting with Congress. You yeah, know, no, he, no, no. He, uh, he believes in government, uh, you know, obviously a much smaller. Yeah, so uh, real quick, guys. I mean, like New Jersey became the 14th state that legalized same-sex marriage. And I think that's a huge accomplishment uh, being where we were actually a year from uh, today's date, actually. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. We only had six states uh, this time last year that... Uh, basically uh, legalized or, or, or same-sex marriage was legalized in that state uh, we can go over certain um, you know the legislator you know we, we could really go into the laws on that but you know basically it was legal in six states but now we're looking at 14 states so within a year we had eight more states legalize same-sex marriage it's a huge accomplishment you got to remember some of these states which i'll go over some statistics uh by court decision you're looking at california on june 28th 2013 connecticut november 12th 2008 and then you have ohio or iowa i should say april 24th 2009 massachusetts which actually was the first state which was may 17th 2004 new jersey currently october 21st 2013 now by state uh legislature it was uh delaware july 1st 2013 minnesota 2013 new hampshire 2010 new york 2011 rhode island 2013 vermont 2009 and by popular vote of course is maine maryland and washington dc which was all um 2012 2013 which was maryland so and you got to remember washington uh, dc washington dc legalized same-sex marriage on may 10th 20 uh, 2012 so I mean like uh, the ball is starting to roll now when it comes to this civil rights issue you know uh, same-sex marriage now uh, like I said last time this year only six states so on and so forth but you know we got to give thanks to the people uh, we got to give thanks to the people basically the 58 percent currently I believe you know that supports gay marriage you know and it, it's the only right it's the right thing to do when you come down to it you know uh, they should have equal rights as a heterosexual couple and you know now we got to look at you know uh, the reason why we're seeing so many states currently is because of what happened, you know, the C Supreme Court decision when it came to uh, overturn and Doma and also Prop 8, you know, in June this year. You know, and also Chris Christie. You got to remember, Chris Christie this year, which I think it was, I forget what date it was, but uh, it was this year. I think it was June where he had, the he only thing Chris Christie had to do was just sign the bill into law. That's all he had to do. It already passed. All he had to do was sign it. He, he refused to sign it. He vetoed it. And he goes, well, I'll just leave it up to, uh, you know, the citizens of New Jersey. I, I couldn't believe it. I, I think if people remember that about Chris Christie and not about what he did currently, I think that's going to be a big point. And that's where I want to get into because I'm from New Jersey. So I've been following this uh, pretty hardcore, you know. Uh, and you know what? I'm glad to see this, man. I'm, I'm glad to see this. And I'm glad to see that the Newark mayor and U.S. Senate elect 
uh, Cory Booker. You know, he actually on uh, 12.01 a.m. October 22nd, he actually uh, had a wedding ceremony and officiated the weather, uh, a wedding ceremony for uh, a gay couple. And I thought that was really great, man. So uh, good for him, you know what I mean? Good for him to uh, sit there and support. And he's actually um, a Democrat, which is pretty good. So, yeah, yeah, I, I did watch the video on uh, Cory Booker, but I won't go there on this. But uh, that being said, I'm going to hand it off to, uh, I guess, uh, Negation. I'll hand that off to you. All right. Thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing that, oh, this happens on one hand, but on the other hand, like they were alluding to, that it is definitely a tactical decision. Um, you know, researching this and finding out just how much in the last House election the Republicans got a boost from the gay vote, um, the exit polls showed that that they got 31% of the gay vote last time in the ha for the House election, and that was up from 19% from in the previous House election. So just in that one election, it doubled. Now, is that because of other factors? I absolutely agree with that. But at the same time, like you were saying, as long as Christie doesn't alienate himself and make himself into the bad guy in the eyes of the LGBT community, he may be able to carry some of that momentum forward to the presidential election. Um, you know, I mean, in April, the, the poll came out that, you know, 53% of Americans said that they favored gay marriage. But keep in mind, when, when it specifically is a breakout for just Republican Party, it's only 27%. So, but counteracting that, and I know I'm flip-flopping here a lot, um, but you got to remember that in the presidential election, Mitt Romney, I mean, he was faced with absolutely saying that gay marriage and gay rights and all of this stuff is wrong. In fact, he's going to repeal DOMA or reenact DOMA, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but that didn't affect him at all in the, and at the same time, he was governor when Massachusetts um, passed gay marriage. So I don't think it's going to play into it at all as far as it's going to hurt him in the presidential election. The only thing that it can do is help. And by him just saying very quietly, if you, you know, he didn't take a press conference, he didn't do it. He is very, very quiet about this, just saying, uh, I don't like it, but it's the law, so I guess I'll have to do it. And it's just regular political bullshit. He is doing the same thing he always does and just, whenever he can get an advantage he's going to play that advantage so that's all i've really got matthew what do you got on this well it's it's important to point out i think that the far right the, the christian conservative stereotype that we all sort of refer to when we talk about republicans it's just one percentage of conservatives um, you, you've got a lot of dis disillusioned people on both sides, and a lot of Republicans and conservatives don't buy into that sort of hybrid strain of, of uh, fanatical, you know, people like Rick Santorum and Michelle Bachman. That's that's just part of the Republicans and the, and the conservatives. And I think that what they really want is for their party, for the Republican Party, to uh, present them with a reasonable, you know, intelligent, progressive almost option, uh, just so that the, that the party itself and the, the the whole ideology doesn't start being socially sidelined. And I think people are terrified on the right. They're terrified of, you know, if it's Hillary Clinton or whoever it's going to be, the next Democrat president. Which I think at this point it's it's reasonable to assume that there's going to be a Democrat president next next term. Uh, I think that they will make a lot of sacrifices and uh, agree to a lot that they normally wouldn't have, especially when, as uh, Live Life pointed out, you've already had just in the last year eight new states uh, agreeing to gay marriage. It's just going to, to continue in the next year, in 2014. You know, who, who knows how many there will be? And by the time the next president is in, is in office, and the next, you know, when we have a new Congress, you know, it's going to be a lot for them to 
uh, apply themselves, the far, far right, to apply themselves to have gay marriage overturned anywhere. They might succeed in one or two states, but I think that the fact that they refuse so hard to change and are just basically blasting progressive attitudes across the board as immoral, even demonic in some cases, they're they're making themselves obsolete in a way. And the smarter conservatives, Republicans, they recognize that and they, they want to move away from it because it, it's alienating to them as well. So Republicans and conservatives are not our ideological enemies. They're they're not um someone who we should consider to be our opponents in in you know making the United States a strong economic and you know social and everything else power in the world today because I think that that's where everyone's sort of trying to go now is is getting back to where the US used to be in terms of its its standing in the world um the only ones that are really standing in the way are the the ones you know it's the vocal minority of of nut jobs and the, you know we we need to keep that in mind that um the the argument against gay marriage for example is strictly religious and you know that's why there's such a huge um a huge support of it even from republicans and it's not just gay marriage it's going to be like that it's going to be all of the big issues that they get, you know, the reasonable ones get drowned out by the, the, the fanatics. And I'm just saying we should, we should make sure we don't ignore uh, the Republicans who do, you know, have light, light interests and uh, with us. And, and, and I mean, I'm sure some of the people listening now are also Republicans and they, they would agree with me. But, yeah. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. I see what you're saying. I, yeah. I would hope so. But that's, I mean, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, it's not just the far right, the, the, the Christian conservative stereotype that is a Republican. And it, I'm I'm very happy to hear about people like Chris Christie. And I hope that there are more Republicans that um, take that step. So that's all I wanted to say. Cool. Yeah, well, definitely well said. Uh, one thing I, I, I will revamp on what I said real quick, and then we'll go into our next topic is real quick is like when, when I talk about Chris Christie on what he had the opportunity to do this year and he didn't do it. So I, I mean, like, I hope people don't forget that. But also, uh, you know, we can live and let live and, and forgive him on that and, and see what he, you know, uh, you got to remember, he he made the attempt to, um, you know, basically, uh you know, to appeal it, you know, he put in his appeal, then he retracted it. That's good. Okay. So maybe he had a, a change of heart. Who knows? I don't know. Um, of course it was a political stunt. We know that, but could we say honestly, he's actually, um, you know, supports gay marriage or was it a political stunt? Of course it was a political stunt. We can't ignore the fact. And I've been watching this topic for so long, but if this is a, even if it was a political stunt, if it is some kind of measure to say, hey, I'm a Republican, uh, and he's a moderate Republican, he's not really a Republican, Republican, conservative, like, you know, the far right, he's not that type of person, you know, that's my, uh, you know, that's my state, New Jersey, you know, that's where I live, so lived here my whole life so i know christy very well but uh yeah he does good there's no doubt he's a good person don't get me wrong i'm like when katrina came uh or both hurricanes actually i should say not katrina the two hurricanes that hit new jersey in the last two years you know yeah he did good man there's no doubt he got the funds out to the people that you know you know need it sandy yeah i should know i went through that hurricane I was living down the shore at the time. But uh, that being said, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's a good topic. And you guys, you know, it's, it's very well said on both parts, all of us. So, uh, yeah, let's get to our next topic, man. I'm pretty excited. Not excited for the next one. It's pretty sad, actually, the next one. So let's get into this. This next topic here is going to be, uh, this story is about Indonesia school, school girls. Uh, it will make you very angry. It's basically about virginity. Uh, testing uh, on Indonesia school girls uh, before they get to college. So uh, let's get into this. An education chief in Indonesia wants to do virginity tests on school age girls to ensure that they're not involved in promiscuous behavior. And if they don't pass, well, they don't get to go on to the next grade. Now, uh, I did a little more research into this to figure out exactly how these virginity tests would take place. And they would literally have their hymens uh, examined by a doctor and it makes me sick to my stomach because it, 
I consider this sexual assault. Forcing girls to go to a doctor to get their hymen checked out so they can pass a virginity test is pathetic and it's sick. Now, similar uh, legislation has been proposed before, um, but it, it, because of a public outcry, uh, nothing happened. They didn't go through with it, and I hope that that will be the case in this particular uh, situation. But wh what the hell? Like, first of all, the boys aren't getting virginity tests. You know no, why? Because really. virginity tests don't make any freaking sense. Just because a girl doesn't have a hymen doesn't mean that she's been sexually active. And then what happens if this girl was raped or molested or something like that? That all of a sudden you're not going to let her go on, carry on with her education because you consider her promiscuous? In Indonesia, there's a lot of reported cases, especially in the rural areas, which are catch up a little bit later, uh, unfortunately, with uh, modern day and what's happening. Uh, if a bride does not bleed on her first night, they return her to her family. And it's not just Indonesia. There are a number of countries that do something similar. And yeah, I know, course, I know yeah. that it, it doesn't happen in Armenia anymore, but back in the day, it was very similar. After the wedding night, uh, the man would have to show like a bloody rag to the parents to like say, yeah, she was clean, she was pure. Disgusting, disgusting. Yeah. Like as if that's the only thing a woman is valuable for, for, for her hymen. Right, let alone the honor killings in Turkey, right. and then the list goes on and on. Here, the uh, Mohammed Rasid, who's a chief of education agency, God help them, in, in Indonesia, in that city in Indonesia, says that this was done as a response to the high rate of adultery and prostitution among female students. God knows what he means by prostitution, whether it's real or what he, you know, refers to as prostitution for ha simply having sex. And uh, he also went on to say, whether a woman wants to stay a virgin or not, that's part of her rights as a woman. But on the other side, we don't want the female students to plunge into negative acts. So, okay. There's something very creepy about an education chief, a male education chief, chief sitting around thinking about the promiscuity of school-age kids. It's yeah, disgusting. I, I always question it, whether it's uh, guys who are so against gay rights here in America or, you know, fundamentalists in, in, in other parts of the world. When they're so fascinated by a certain topic, you begin to wonder, again, the doctors would be doing the checks, not the education minister, but why is, we, we hope and presume, but why is he so obsessed with like, oh, we gotta check their hymens, et cetera, and the double standard, I know, guys don't have hymens, we get that, right? But at the same time, nobody's even bothering asking. Like, one thing you could do is you could do a polygraph test, yeah. you know, if you care that much. You'd be like, all right, did you lose your virginity or not? And by the way, if you care so much about religion, it's also in all of these religions that you're not supposed to masturbate. You want to make sure that uh, those people don't move on to the next grade level? Probably not, because there might not be a single student left in Indonesia. Negation. Unreal, man. It's just, it's amazing that it's 2013 and this crap is still going on. I mean, like, like Jink was saying, I mean, the honor killing deal alone if we just stopped at that one statistic when you look at societies that commit honor killings in this the vast majority even when the woman is the one raped they will kill the woman and if do anything at all to the man it is they don't in most cases they don't kill him and if there is an honor killing the only time that he gets killed is when he refuses to marry his victim now Again, think about that. I mean, most of these societies, they will either require the man to marry his victim, which means she gets to live with that asshole for the rest of her life and probably have kids by him and get, get raped nightly, quote unquote, legally, or, well, I should say, and or compensate the father for his loss. Doesn't They don't do shit to the woman. It's They compensate the father and they make the man, if anything, marry the woman. Now, in a lot of cases, they just kill the woman outright because somehow her getting raped has brought dishonor to the family. And what's amazing is, is it's her own family that carries out the honor killings. Um, you know, all this does is speak to what societies think of woman, women. I mean, if you go and you look at the sexual behavior in most westernized um, England. If you look at the 15 year olds and see in the polls show that how many kids have actually engaged in sex by the time they were 15. And what I'm gonna, the ones I'm gonna highlight are the ones I found interesting. England, boys, 34% are active. 
Girls, 40% are active. <laughs> Finland, 23 to 32. Scotland, 32 to 34. Sweden, 24 to 29. And Wales is 27 to 29. Now, in every one of those cases, the women are more active than the men. Now, if you overlay those countries and you figure out what's happening in those countries as far as women's rights, um, the way that they're treated as far as monetarily and how much money they make compared to other men, it's almost equal. You can see what happens when women actually get treated the same their society actually comes up and it is equal now. Now you can look at the flip side of that. Let's look at, oh, I don't know, Africa, where not only are virgins valued, valued to such a degree by some, some of the societies there, not because the virginity is that important, it's because it's magical. It cures AIDS. And there is a huge influx of women getting raped there, mostly children, young, young girls, because the guy that has AIDS decides he's going to rape her to quote unquote, cure his AIDS. Now he doesn't care if it doesn't work and she gets AIDS and she ends up dying five years later because she's not worth anything. Who the hell cares? I mean, this topic, especially a girl absolutely drives me crazy. I just, I cannot stand it. So yeah, well. that's all I've really got. I just, I want to go, go on from there. Sure. Matthew. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to point out that, you know, we talk about honor killings, uh, mostly being in Muslim cultures, but there are still plenty of really horrible things that are done in Christian cultures, uh, you know, in Africa, as well as, uh, some areas of the Middle East are Christian, but, the reason that we don't see those things here is because of secular laws and education. It's not that the religion is any different. It's just a, uh, like a, uh, I don't want to say a more primitive strain, but it's a more pure strain uh, that's unfiltered by secular education in those countries. The, the difference being, you know, when you raise, as, as Negation was saying, when you raise the quality of living for women, it, it makes... You know, it, it just makes, it filters down that children are also better educated. Everyone is better educated. And then you don't have these sort of barbarities just, as, uh, you know, everyone expecting that that's the way life is, is going to be, you know, what's the, that, that it's, it's, um, it's okay. You know, it, uh, if you go to a culture where they, they, um, you know, they still bury children underneath the foundations of buildings for good luck, or, you know, um, if, you know, whatever, if, if you go to a culture where they still do that and try to figure out, you know, what sort of, of morality leads, um, leads them to think that that's okay. It's just because it's tradition. They've been doing it for so long and they're not thinking about it. So really the, the key to stopping things like this happening, whether it's in Indonesia or, uh, in, in, you know, whatever African country where they're, they're still practicing female genital, mu genital mu mutilation, the key is educating the women. And that is, especially in Middle Eastern countries, that is what they're really trying to oppose, is the education of women. Because it, it would take away their power, it would take away the men's power, and it would, um, it would just completely turn everything. And I think that this is just another uh, case of... Um, a, a power issue. I, I think, really think that um, you know, doing things like this to to the women, the the, the young women in in, in Indonesia, it's, it's just keeping that control and and uh, being afraid to let them have equality, and it's out of fear. It's out of fear of giving away that power, and and you know that is without. I mean. Without a doubt, that is the best way to raise the quality of living in any country that you're in, is educating the women. <laughs> this is, uh, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really amazed that, um, that we're still hearing stuff like this, because with, with mass media these days, as fast as, as it's growing, and cell phones are getting to all of these um, places, even in Africa where they're, you know, they were completely isolated before, 
the pressure from other countries is is growing all the time to be more reasonable with your your citizens and 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 do away with these sort of practices. So I would think that in the next maybe ten or fifteen years, uh, at the most, you know, a generation, stuff like this is just going to disappear, or you'll just never hear about wow. it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, like, uh, what I want to say, I really don't have too much to say on this. I'm mean, like, it really speaks for itself, but you guys did a wonderful job. What I want to just add there, I'm like, what's next? The chastity, chastity belt? It's like, come on. I mean, like, we, we know that it was implemented, like, after the 16th uh, you know, century, but it's like, come on, man. It's like, it's getting pretty sad nowadays, man. You know, and, and to be honest with you, uh, name this. To, I mean, does it, like, it, it, it's religion. I mean, like, the main cause is religion. We know that. I mean, like, what else is it to be blamed on? Do, do you guys, can you guys answer that or no? Or is it just strictly a religious view when it comes to this? I think it's also like a power issue. It's not just religion. Like a power trip, religion yeah. is a system of power, so it all ties together. Gotcha. All right, so uh, what we're going to do right now, we're going to go to our, uh, if you guys have anything else to say on this topic, any of you guys? No? Nothing else? No. Question each other. There you go. Okay, cool. What we're going to do right now, we're going to go to our uh, third topic, and then we're going to get to the CUDA report, which uh, is, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, you're going to see our new co-host, Cocktopus uh, Prime in action, TJ. So uh, we'll get to that in a little bit here. But uh, our next topic we're going to discuss right now is actually going to be Barber and Staver. When it comes to freedom, President Obama is the enemy within politics and religion. So let's get into this topic real quick. And of course, the uh, White House, uh, the talking point of this administration was, oh, this is an isolated incident. We're looking into it. Well, after a dozen or so of these, quote, isolated incidents, it becomes systemic and systematic. So this is policy. This is so the leftists can deny it until they're blue in the face. Uh, the Obama administration is overtly, systemically and systematically uh, displaying hostility toward biblical Christianity. And it all started by homosexualizing the military. Now they want to liberalize the military. And ultimately the end game here, Matt, and there's no question about it, is to completely secularize the United States military and to push to the fringes those who have a biblical worldview. You know, when I was uh, younger and we had the uh, Soviet Union as the big uh, uh, nation in the world that was the enemy of humanity and uh, ultimately of freedom, I often thought it's great to live in America because we can trust our our news media and our government, and uh, of course the military, the uh, the Soviet Union lied to its people. Now we're at a, a time we're at a very unusual time in America, Matt, and I think a lot of people have the same feeling, where we can no longer trust our government. We can't trust this administration. This administration has an ideology. It is the most ideologically driven administration in history. And its administration is designed to divide us, to uh, take people that are law-abiding individuals, they're pro-family, pro-life, they're Christian, and they want to demonize them and stigmatize them. Matt, President Obama is to freedom is the enemy within. He is trying to divide and conquer. He is dividing the American people, dividing the military, and seeks to conquer it for the secular socialist political, sociopolitical worldview. Matthew? Uh, I think that it's pretty clear that um, if you know anything about the U.S. military, it is theocratic. Uh, they, they're they very, very dogmatic um, about uh, being against atheists or non-believers uh, in the military. It's Everything is very Christian in the U.S. military. Um, plenty of evidence for that. And I, I wanted to address more what the second guy was saying. I think it was... Uh, uh, I think that was actually Barber, the, the, the silver-haired guy that was talking at the end there. Uh, uh, I wanted to talk about his, his you know, ridiculous comments about no longer being able to trust your government, um, the, you know, media sources and everything like that. And, and as if this is a new development that you, you should be skeptical of your your government and what they tell you, what the media tells you, as if he's making it sound like there's this new um, dishonesty that was never there before. And it's just, it's so, 
uh, so ludicrous to anyone who's who's over the age of five that you should you know doubt what the what the, the what the government and the media tell you when you have a president like Bill Clinton saying I did not have sexual relations relations with that woman and you know comes out and admits later that he 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 was lying I mean uh, how much I mean and that's just in the last you know 15 years I think it's 15. Um, 20 years, whatever, but it, it goes all, so much farther back than that, the, the, the Bay of Tonkin and, and, and Vietnam and, and Watergate and just all the way back. I don't, I don't see how anyone could possibly be naive enough. So obviously that must be rhetoric. And he's just, um, like I said, the negation in an email the other day, it's, it's like they're trying to link it all together, the evil of socialism um, you know, being an enemy of humanity and talking about um, all of these ways that, that Obama is trying to do the same thing, turn the United States into uh, like a, a monster uh, of, you know, antichrist. All of that just, they're trying to use the rhetoric of uh, him being the antichrist without actually mentioning it. Uh, so it'll be politically uh, palatable. Uh, it's just it's disgusting. That's, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, mm -hmm. Negation? Yeah, man, I'll, I'll actually tag right along with that. I mean, again, I, I've got a lot of um, old military experience, even at, a, at military institutions. Um, and what's funny is all you have to do to, to test just how oh, entrenched religion is in the military is look at the oath of enlistment. Now, remember, the oath of enlistment is for any commissioned officer and any enlisted personnel. Everyone must. It is not optional. You must quote this, and you must quote it verbatim. And if, if you don't believe me, all you have to do is, is go look up Title 10, Section 502 of the US, United States Code. It specifically says what you have to say, and there is no um, verbiage there that would allow you to change one word. And if you don't recite it the way that it's set there, you're not enlisted. You are not commissioned. You will not be in the military. So let's just read the last line. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just the whole line, the last line. It states, I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to regulation and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Justice. Yeah. So help me God. That is part of the legal requirement to get into the military. So, uh, <laughs> right there, throws out all those idiots' arguments. Now, as far as uh, Obama, quote-unquote, attacking all of the people in churches, let's just look at the uh, parsonage exemption, which anyone that is clergy doesn't have to pay taxes on a lot of their stuff, especially some of their um, their housing. Um, so if the if um, the minister's housing costs were revoked, in, in other words, they had to pay um, taxes just on that. The American clergy members would cumulati cumulatively, ah, God, I can't talk tonight, lose an estimated two point three billion dollars every five years. And that's if we froze it right now. Yeah. We're giving them $2.3 billion over five years and somehow we're whatever. Wow. And the last point that I've got here is, is that every year religious institutions take in at this point in time, 82 and a half billion. Yes, that is B as in Bravo. Wow. A year. Now, who must? I mean, who's lying here? It's pretty damn apparent. Uh, Joe, go ahead. I'm done. Uh, well, well said, man. What I really want to get at real quick, and this is the only thing I really got to see on this topic, is when it comes to these types of idiots, these uh, extremists. Uh, I'm going to call them extremists because that's what they are. Verbally, they are extremists. You know, they need to realize that this is not a Christian nation. I mean, like, um, 
you know, it's a secular nation. I'm like, our laws for the most part are secular in, in general, you know, and, and if you think this is a Christian nation, if there's some Christians here, we don't hate you. That's fine. You know, you have your rights just like we have our rights, but it is a secular nation. It's a, it, if you want to really, if you want to really research something, uh, if you want to know how laws are made, please research the lemon test. If you don't know what the lemon test is, and I need to bring this up is the lemon test, which details the regular or requirements for legislation concerning religion. It consists of of three prongs. The first prong is the government's action must have secular legislative purpose. Uh, the government's action must not have the priority effect of either advancing or inhibiting religion. Okay, so there's a little quality there. And then third prong is the government's action must not result in an excessive government entanglement with religion. The entanglement prong. Okay, so uh, people need to realize that, you know, it's actually, you know, Mm -hmm. Take it, take it for what it's worth, but that's the lemon test. So I need to, I, I had to say that, so I had to bring that up. But uh, anything else before we uh, get to a break, and uh, we'll bring up the Cuda report with Cocktopus Prime, TJ. It's going to be great, man. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be good, guys. Yeah. It's our little, uh, I guess you say, uh, comedic little uh, segment that we're going to have every week, and this is actually we're going to make this official. It's going to be the first episode because Cocktopus Prime, TJ, is our official host of uh the cooter report and we got to give props to talladega tom for making up uh the name you know coming up with the name cooter report so uh, talladega tom a plus uh for you man thank you so uh let's take a little break here come in a break i'll play a song and then we'll get into the cooter report when we come back so stay tuned All right, everybody, welcome back to the Skeptic Fence Show and uh, our new segment, guys. It's our first episode of this segment and it is called The Cooter Report. And it's going to be uh, pretty freaking hilarious, if you ask me, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to have a skeptic's viewpoint on the issue at hand or the topic. So, uh, Negation, would you like to or would you like me to do it to explain what The Cooter, Cooter Report is and how we uh, came up with that name, or I should say, Tal Dega Tom came up with that name? Yeah, I can go. I mean, sure. Basically what it was is, you know, we've been over the last, what, six months trying to reformulate the show and get it into a position to where we really thought it was going to be as, you know, as fun as possible, as interesting as possible, and kind of springboard off of what we already accomplished beforehand. Um, now, what we knew we were missing is someone who was just pure, pure, pure humor, really funny person. I'm way too serious. We hoped that Matthew would come on board. He's a lot like me as far as serious, and his humor is dry. Um, you're a real good bridge between the two, but we had nobody that was just absolutely funny as hell. Yeah. And when we, when Cocktopus agreed that he'd like to be part of the show, we were, you know, we were head over heels. It was perfect. And this is a perfect uh, exactly. segment. Yeah, it's a perfect segment for him, guys. And the backbone, exactly. the backbone of the idea of the Cuda Report that Tal Dega Tom came up with it is a video called Ock the Skeptical Caveman. And I just actually contacted those guys today that made that video. And I haven't heard back from them, but uh, hopefully they, they enjoy it. So we'll see what happens. So uh, let's get on with the Cuda Report. Here we go. <laughs> This is Cocktopus Prime reporting for the Cuda Report on the Skeptic Defense Show. And uh, th this is our first show, uh, our first clip, our, our first story. So I figured it would be appropriate to talk about golden showers. So my wife... There's, I'm meeting with 40 pastors. I come upstairs, an angel comes to her. She's covered in gold. She, she showered, come out, it's all covered in gold. It was all over the bed in the hotel room, all over the floor. I said, this isn't just a little gold dust where you're trying to yeah. see it on your hand. It was everywhere. Yeah. The great thing about that, or the interesting thing about that, was we switched hotels three times. And every time we switched the hotel, the same thing would happen. We'd check into the room, and there would be gold all over the floor, gold all over the mm -hmm. bed. Do 
Peter. I'd never seen, I, I heard about it. I know it's happened with other yeah. ministries, but I said, this is the most amazing. And it was happening to my wife. Uh -huh. We got on the airplane to fly one night only from Tonga to Johannesburg. I was preaching in Johannesburg one night. And we're on the airplane heading up there, and the gold appeared all over the floor in front of our seats where we were sitting on the airplane. Checked into the hotel in Johannesburg, <laughs> the gold was there. Can I get some of whatever this motherfucker is on, please? Seems like a good time. Gold everywhere, every fucking where you go, the plane, the hotel, all over, all over Africa, by the way, gold, all over Africa. God is much more concerned with making sure you and your wife are showered with gold, God's golden showers, than to feed any of the hungry, starving children in Africa, or cure any of the kids dying from curable diseases, or, or help out in any fucking way. No, no, God is much too preoccupied giving you and your wife a golden shower. Mm. Then when we flew back to the revival, because it was just in the first yeah. few days of the revival, they found two diamonds, one on the way in and one on the way out, of the airport. And I thought, who just finds a random diamond? And then we're having this gold cloud of glory follow yeah. us everywhere we go. Okay, okay. I, I think I got this one figured out. I'm pretty sure he went to Africa to preach. And what he actually did was he, he's, he went to Pat Robertson's diamond mine and was trying to smuggle some of those fucking diamonds back, I guess. <laughs> what the fuck? What makes you think that jewelry, which is something that Jesus would have said give to the poor, uh, like being found is, I don't know, wait, what is that? Like angels, angels just sprinkle gold dust on me and then there's just diamonds everywhere. Like if you had that much jewelry, you could maybe afford some tattoos that didn't look like you got them in prison. We show up in the meetings and within the first few days, this gold would start falling in the meetings. And when I say falling in the meetings, I had one meeting where we were in worship and you could see the cloud of glory, like, like wow. you open eyes yeah. <laughs> and it rained gold. When I say it rained gold, Rick, I actually saw almost looked like snowflakes of gold coming down. Not, huh. not just a little dust. Hey, do you see? It yeah. was like raining yeah. all over the carpet, all over the sanctuary. This guy is an obvious lying sack of shit. <laughs> and um, the people that believe him and listen to him, they deserve to be cheated out of their fucking money because they are beyond help and retardedly gullible. Uh, and it is uh, for the reason that he's such an obvious liar that I'm going to award him the Cooter Report's Cooter Award for being the dumbest horn kicker in the video. All right, Cocktopus out. See you guys next show. <laughs> So there you go, guys. Cocktopus Prime, our new co-host for the segment, The Cooter Report. And uh, yeah, he did a wonderful job and negation. Yeah, that's I mean, just to be clear, guys. That's what he's going to be doing every week. He he wants to come on with us, and if he gets out early, he'll definitely be the fourth, um, you know, co-host. But when he can't, he's going to make you know his cooter report regardless, and you know, and have it posted. We'll be the first ones to air it and the whole deal. But man, I mean, again, it's it's freaking cocktopus. I mean, it's perfect for him, and it's it's amazing that people still believe shit like that yeah I, but when you compare it to some of the bullshit that happened in the bible it's really not that far-fetched anymore so i mean i just big props to cock that was great and i, I I'm, I'm so amused i can't even think straight yeah right. i don't even know what else we can add to that i'm like you did such a wonderful job <laughs> know, but, uh, it's, it's awesome matthew i just I have, I have to say whoever came up with that theme song I, I I love you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, the funny thing is, is it's so perfect because Cockpus always says in his videos, derp. So I was just like, okay, that's awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, that's so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, interrupt you. Guys. Great. I just, I just wanted to say that. I, I think that he did a great job. Yeah. So, uh, Props to Cockpus, man. Good job on that. But uh, one thing I want to bring up is it, it pretty – it amazes me when you look at the other guy, the guy in, the, you know, the white hair. Like he was like, yeah, okay, uh-huh. Deep down inside, I think this guy's like, man, this was this is one fucked up motherfucker, dude. I'm <laughs> seriously, I'm like, how can you sit there and actually interview a pastor from another, you know, church, whatever, and, and just really sit through that interview without thinking to yourself, 
dude, you need to get fucking help, dude. If you really think you're seeing this shit, and go, dude, you really need to get the fuck help, dude. Really, I I don't know what to tell you, dude. I, I mean, like, be honest with you. <laughs> what happened to all of it? I mean, does it just evaporate? Yeah, and, and, and you're like a cockpit said, you're in Africa. I'm like, well, don't you think all these fucking African people be picking that fucking gold up and say, what the fuck? Or you think he would be giving it to the fucking people exactly. in Africa to say, hey, listen, you're good now. Here you go. Here's some money. Let's build some towns. Let's build, let's build a little city. Let's, let's, let's get this shit going on here. But really? Really, is this food. this yeah. is what's so weird about these people that are extreme Christians that they're, they're they're manipulated by people like this for money and they and they they just tend to frig over, man. Don't get me wrong, some of that money does good. There's no doubt, but you know, a lot of these people live in the lap of luxury when they get that money. Some don't, but most of them do. I'd say, but it's truth. But uh, that's all I really gotta say. Should we take a break? Unless you guys ain't have anything else to say, we could take a little small little break here, like a two minute break, and then what we could do is get our uh, guest in, man. Our guest, we're pretty excited to have him on, Raphael Letaster. You know, the author of. Let me get this right because I almost got it wrong before. There was no Jesus, there is no God. So uh, let's take a little break here, unless you guys got anything else to say, and then uh, we'll go, we'll bring him in, man. We got a lot of questions for him, man. It's gonna be a pretty long segment, so and we're about five ten minutes behind right now. So anything else? Now let's go. Nope. All right, so uh, let's take a break and we'll be right back. All right, I think we are good to go now. We had a little small technical issue, but it was quickly fixed. So, uh, Raphael Latasta, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, I'm on. Thank you very much for having you having me on the show. No, absolutely. It's our pleasure, man. Uh, thanks for coming on. And uh, yeah, we're going to get right into this. But uh, uh, guys, tonight our guest is Raphael Letaster. He's the author of There Was No Jesus, There Is No God. And correct me if I'm wrong, Raphael, is that your main site is basically pantheismunites.org, correct? And then your, uh, your of course, your uh, personal website would be raphaelletaster.com. Did I get that correct or no? Yes, that's uh, pretty much, it's pretty much the same site. And uh, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Phil Robinson of yes. New Skeptics, mm -hmm. who's been uh, really fundamental in, uh, in getting me on this show. Yeah, he was actually, and we were going to give him a little uh, little props too also. Negation was going to give him a little props, but yeah, Phil, a uh, great guy, nice guy, and uh, yeah, he's doing a great job, man. And I, I appreciate him uh, lining this up uh, tonight, so yeah, I'm pretty excited. Yeah, so. definitely. Negation? Uh, yeah, I mean... Is he he wrote us on the um, Skeptic Fence um, Facebook page, and that's how we hooked up. So big props, guys! And again, just just for the audience and the viewers out there, guys, if y'all have people that you want to hear, it doesn't have to be you know religious based by any means. Anything that we can explore skeptically, hit us up either on the forums. That's probably the best way to us, um, or Facebook. I mean, we check that all the time, so we'll definitely take your advice. And if you've got contact to the people. You know, let us know because we want to have them on. Um, and I was going to go into a little bit of your uh, bio, Raphael. And again, thanks for coming out. It's really sure, my pleasure. Um, but I kind of feel like you could do a whole lot better job than I can. <laughs> I mean, why don't you kind of give us a breakdown on, on what you've done and what your bio is, and um, we can get it done a little quicker that way. I think. Okay, sure. I'm a uh... I like to call myself a professionally secular PhD researcher at the University of Sydney. I'm in the studies studies in religion department, and uh, I've got a I've got a varied background. I've worked in pharmacy, medicine, finance. I was a fundamentalist Christian as well, obviously not anymore. And uh, my main research interests at the moment are uh, in philosophy of religion, and also in uh, Christian origins and Bayesian uh, Bayesian reasoning. And I'm also interested in pantheism, which is an exciting alternative to monotheism. And um, I've just recently finished my master's thesis, which does look at the question of Jesus' uh, possible ahistoricity, the theories that maybe Jesus didn't exist as a historical person. And that, uh, that actually went down really well. That was well received. And I basically concluded that it's not crazy to question Jesus' historicity, which is generally the feeling that, uh, that you get from scholars, is that it's absolutely silly to ask whether Jesus existed or not. And uh, now for my doctoral work, I am looking into the philosophical arguments for God's existence that are usually put forward by famous apologists like William Lane Craig and Richard Swinburne and Alvin Plantinga, these sort of figures. 
And um, yeah, so I'm looking into those arguments, finding out what, what exactly is wrong with them, and eventually I'll hope to get that out into the public. Nice. I'm looking forward to it. Matthew, do you have anything? Um, I, aside from uh, you know getting right into the questions, um, I, I wanted to see what else you're working on right now besides your, your doctoral work. Yeah, we're, that's actually one of my questions, so I, we can hit that when we, when we get to it, maybe. Is All that right. fine? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll just go right into my questions then. Um, first off, based on the Raphael, that I wanted to, to thank you for coming on the show, and first yeah. off, I wanted to um, make a comment about your the title of your book being um, uh, There Was No Jesus, There Is No God. Um, I, I understand because you know we've had a little bit of dialogue through negation. He's he sort of explained to me uh, why you're you're naming it that. Um, but I, I from a, a sol a, a, the perspective of, of a solipsist, which I'm not. I'm just you know playing devil's adv advocate, if you will. I'm I'm wondering sure. um, if we can't technically know anything except that we exist if that's really the only thing that we can claim beyond any doubt that we that we know. Um, uh, how does that apply to uh, what you're trying to do with um, with your your proving of the um, the historicity of of Jesus and how your um, your suggestion of, of using Bayesian um, uh, reasoning to evaluate these these sort of things. All of it together, it sounds like, especially with the title of your book, that there's a very strong case that you're making that Jesus most likely did not exist. So I'm, I'm just wondering what is your perspective on that with regards to you know, the, uh, the epistemic aspect of it. Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question. And uh, it does give me the opportunity as well to clarify my title. The title is Intentionally Hyperbolic. It's, uh, it's a bit of a reference to the, uh, the common attitude towards atheists, that atheists somehow need to prove that God didn't exist. I do, I do mention that in the introduction of the book, so people can, can really quickly see what the book is about. It's, it's about the evidence for Christian evidentialism. And I, I basically agree with that concept that we can't absolutely know anything except that we exist, I think that is a, a pretty humble and, and pretty good concept. And that is actually the point of my book. The point of my book is humility. It's saying that um, there is a lot of uncertainty. There is a lot of reason to be doubtful of just about anything, just about everything. So it does make sense to have that, uh, that humility. And, but having said that, that's not the same thing as saying that, that there are no objective truths or that we should stop trying to figure out what these objective truths are, if they exist at all. So um, I, I do think it's a good argument in the sense that uh, we didn't evolve to grapple with these sorts of questions, questions of, uh, big questions about the universe, life, God, etc. We evolved to avoid you know, lions and tigers and OMI. We evolved to survive in the unforgiving environments. We didn't evolve to try and, and, and grapple with the mysteries of the universe. Great answer. I, I, I was very. I listened to a, a a speech that you gave at a pub that's on YouTube. I don't remember <laughs> if that's on your uh, your uh, channel or not. But I was I was fascinated with what you said because you uh, you seem to hold a lot of the viewpoints that we hold um, in terms of how you should approach skepticism of religion and um, not just in terms of being a non-believer, but just in general, and how you approach uh, anything in life that requires belief. Um, so my, my next question is, um, what, in your opinion, is the underlying reason or reasons that, say, someone like William Lane Craig, who is such a strong Christian and a very intelligent man, yeah. um, why do you think... Uh, someone who is so intelligent would not just hold but champion um, what we would not be able to call anything but unreasonable or irrational uh, irrational beliefs. Why would they do that? Certainly. And uh, I think I'm well placed to answer that question because with me it's not mere speculation. I, 
I actually was a fundamental Christian. I was of that Craigian type, although at the time I wasn't as, uh, as, as, as knowledgeable or sophisticated. But I think religion is it's very personal. It's also very cultural. It, uh, it can really form a part of who a person is. So denying that, um, admitting that you're wrong or could be wrong, can be very painful and, and, and a big blow to the ego. Now, um, this, this point may be a little less relevant, but I think that religious beliefs also help give us a base on which to build on. So, like stereotyping, it just saves time. It allows us to say, okay, these questions are sorted, let's move on with our lives. Let's deal with, with other more important issues. And obviously, stereotyping is generally not such a good idea. It can lead to racism and sexism and homophobia and the likes. But uh, it does save time. And it does allow us to go on with the business of hunting, gathering, building fires, finding snug caves to keep our families warm, etc. So, uh, yeah, basically, that, that's what I think it is. It, it, it gives us easy answers, and that allows us to move on with our lives. And it gives us structure as well. Yeah, I think that that's. I I would have to completely agree with that. Um, I think that it has. It's very personal, and that's why you hear uh, in discussions with theists, um, it seems to them like you're attacking them personally when you attack their beliefs, and that is because they hold them so dearly as part of their identity. Exactly. Um, instead of just being John Smith, they're John Smith, a Christian. So when you attack the Christianity, you attack them personally. And that's yeah. something that we have to fight our way through when we talk to them. Um, and my third question is, what, ideally, what effect would you like to see come from using, um, you know, your modified version of Bayes' theorem with regards to um, religious uh, scholar, scholarly work? I don't necessarily, necessarily want to limit that just to the Bible, because obviously it could work for any religion any um, uh, supernatural claim, even. So what what would you hope comes from this short-term or long-term to use this new system that you're proposing? Sure. Well, um, it's a bit of a, a pipe dream, considering where a lot of the funding comes from, but I, I would like to see big and drastic changes in, in the academy when it comes to how uh, religion is treated. And uh, I think it's helpful to explain as well the different, uh, the different academic fields that deal with religion. Uh, one is theology, which is obviously um, biased towards uh, religion, such as Christianity. Then there's also biblical studies, which, uh, which is meant to be more critical, more, um, more objective. But if we read books like The End of Biblical Studies by Professor uh, Hector Avalos, we understand that even, even that field is generally biased towards Christianity as well. Then there's also religious studies, which is my discipline, and that's uh, meant to be even more, um, more openly uh, objective, unbiased, skeptical, if you will. And uh, I think that it, it's, it's tough to answer in the sense that Bayesian reasoning is already adopted by a lot of people, um, even if those people don't actually realize it, such as with history. Richard Carey, of course, has written a book um, about the use of Bayesian reasoning in, uh, in history, as Tucker has also uh, done before him. And uh, these books essentially show that there are a lot of people that do use what I call Bayesian reasoning. They just might not, not know it yet. Now, I think that um, one of the changes I'd like to see is that more and more scholars dealing with religion keep their personal beliefs to themselves when it comes to conducting professional research, and especially when it comes to using their authority as subject matter experts in conversing with the public. That's something that really, um, really irks me. I mean, I, I respect the likes of John Dixon, who's an Australian uh, biblical scholar, who admits in the professional sense that miracles can't be proven alone by historical methods. Well, I think that that's kind of the point that we have to get to with uh, with any uh, dialogue about religion, whether it's academic or just uh, you know a lay person talking to a lay person, is for them to realize or at least acknowledge that faith is not something that they're going to necessarily be able to 
rationally explained. And when it comes to something as um, as important as determining what's happened in the past, that has to be taken into account. So I think you're absolutely right about um, having religious scholars set aside their beliefs of what happened and trying to be as unbiased as they can. So that's that's all the questions that I had for you, and I'm going to pass it over to Live Life. Hello. Oh, there you are. Hey, we're back. I'm very, very sorry for that. I think. Oh, you're a- you're in Australia, man. It's okay. We understand that there's going to be technical difficulties on a show like this, so that's fine. Welcome back. It may have actually been an act of God, literally. <laughs> um, <laughs> Obviously, he's not too happy with what's happening right now. But um, in Australia, in my in my part of Australia, New South Wales, we've had a lot of problems with um, bushfires, and uh, I guess that can affect uh, the chances of uh, blackouts or brownouts, as you might call them. Yeah, uh-huh. that's that's what happened, unfortunately. Oh, that's great though. We're we're back. Negation. You want to finish up, or you want to get into your question? I, I, it's up to you. No, I say. I mean. I'd, I'd much rather talk to him than you guys listen to me talk about math, I guarantee you. <laughs> Great, so let's go on with your questions and we'll, we'll get to it. Like to point out, sure. we, uh, we should, um, you know, as, as Negation was, was saying, we should explain a little bit of how Bayesian reasoning can be applied to history, uh, to uh, historical texts and, and exactly. historical consensus. Um, I think that that's important because if the, you mm-hmm. know, not everyone's going to be yeah. familiar with even what Bayes' theorem is. So, you know, ex- you know, if you continue explaining that, exactly. or maybe let Raphael do it, that would be, I think, very yeah, helpful. In fact, yeah, um, Raphael, in fact, well, let's just start with that one. Um, you know, I mean, your book basically demonstrates that Bayes' theorem can be used, um, in my opinion, as definitive as possible to demonstrate that the likelihood of Jesus um, wasn't... De- And yeah. what was even more interesting is, is that you didn't even get into the mathematics. You just used pure Bayesian <laughs> reasoning to get there. Yeah. So could you kind of go over, you know, in, I know it's it can be complicated anyway. The math is only algebra, but at the same time. Is um, this your questions or no? no. Yeah, the, okay. the thing is, is, you know, um, uh, well, in fact, let's we'll come back to that one because that was my second question. Um uh, on your um, your web your web link to the um, Pantheist, Pantheist Unite, um, kind of give us an explanation of for connections are all that type of thing. So. Sure, sure. Uh, Pantheist Pantheism Unite is my uh, basically my website that I use to communicate with the general public. I'll put my scholarly articles on there, but also some uh, not so scholarly writings as well. And uh, I do have uh, some sympathy to the, the concept of pan- pantheism. It, um, pantheism can mean a lot of different things. I'm a, I like the Dawkins version of pantheism, that is essentially the sexed up atheism. Uh, there's naturalistic pantheism, which basically that is. There's, there's no need to uh, hold supernatural views there. I myself don't hold any supernatural views, although pantheism can go into a supernatural uh, direction. Uh, pantheism is a view that I find particularly exciting um, with regards to the evidence for God's existence, which is what a lot of my research has been into, because these um, these arguments that argue for a God, they tend to just assume that that God happens to be the monotheistic God that you find in Islam, Christianity, etc., that it happens to be a classical theistic kind of God. It seems that monotheism just gets a free pass in the uh, in the scholarly world. So a lot of my research at the moment is revealing that uh, pantheism and and different versions of pantheism may actually be more plausible than monotheism. And one particular pantheistic view I I enjoy looking into is pandeism. It uh, it actually might be a view that can satisfy a lot of us, even, even hardcore atheists, because the conclusion of pandeism is pretty much that although there may have been a god, God is actually dead. So Nietzsche was, was kind of right in that sense. But uh, the idea with pandeism is that God became the universe. So God gave of God's body to create the universe. So there's a lot of interesting ideas um, with, with pantheism, and uh, I like looking into that, and I think it's, it's very compatible with uh, atheism and skeptic, skepticism in general. But it also, pantheism has a lot of positive connotations as well, because it basically means everything 
is God, and that, that pretty much means everything is everything and everything is one. There's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of sociological and ecological benefits to a pantheistic worldview, as opposed to monotheism, which teaches of segregation, it teaches exclusivism, which uh, I think generally is not so good for the world. Yeah, but it, it was really interesting going through that. The thing that a lot of people bring with pantheism is the baggage of, yeah, it, it still is a, a, a God belief, a, a theistic type um, religious, which it can be. I, I absolutely understand that, but it seems sure. the way that you're using it really isn't. So, Yeah, that's right. And um, I, I think it's an interesting concept because of both of those directions you can go into, in that it's a bit of a unifying concept. It can bring people together that are uh, very skeptical and people that actually do have uh, beliefs in spiritual kind of beliefs that may be different to uh, your typical monotheistic kind of beliefs. Hmm. All right. And okay, so now let's let's go back to the uh, the Bayesian part. Um, yeah. If you could just kind of break down in as simple of terms as you possibly can, you know, number one, what Bayesian reasoning is, and I don't know if you want to get into Bayes' theorem, but and how you and some others are starting to apply it specifically to try to demonstrate the probability or, or more accurate, the lack thereof, um, when mm -hmm. it comes to at least Christ in your book. So. Yeah, definitely. And this is good because it links to the question that uh, we were interrupted with when God was unhappy with it. But um, I, I like talking about what I call Bayesian reasoning because Bayes' theorem is a uh, intimidating looking formula that not everyone's going to be able to use. And with, with Bayesian reasoning, I think that's a very, um, very reasonable way of, of using this approach when it comes to the social sciences, when it comes to history, because it, it may not be all that uh, easy to come up with numbers. And the way I, uh, I use and discuss Bayesian reasoning is basically that you're considering the truth of a hypothesis. And you're not just looking, there's four elements. You're, you're looking at the hypothesis itself and you're looking at the evidence for that hypothesis. Now, basically, everyone can agree with that, no matter what your position. If you're going to argue for a hypothesis, then you, you probably should have some sort of evidence for it. Even the internet conspiracy theorists can agree with that. But there are another two elements that I consider uh, to be crucial to Bayesian reasoning, and that is that we're also looking at all the other hypotheses all the other alternative explanations that could also be the case. And we're also looking at all of the evidence that we have accumulated up to this point. So we're not just considering the evidence that, that conveniently supports a person's theory. We're looking at all the evidence as well. For instance, with miraculous claims, the evidence might be scientific evidence that says people don't walk on water. You know, that's something that needs to be factored into the prior probability of a claim. And this concept of prior probability is also crucial to Bayesian reasoning, and that factors into all the evidence and alternative explanations as well. And um, but uh, we we can discuss that a, a bit later. How how I use this to to show that the biblical Jesus, or even God, or other such concepts, uh, has a truth probability of virtually zero percent, is that if you look at the structure of Bayes' theorem, you see that the the prior probability um, can only be overcome if it's very low on the other part of the formula where the evidence is factored in. The evidence there must, must be really good. Now, when it comes to, say, miraculous claims, which is basically um, a, a big part of the belief in the biblical Jesus and God and, and other such things, we've got a very low prior probability. And there's a number of reasons for that with, uh, with miracles, for example. These are unlikely events. By definition, they're unlikely events. And, and you can argue over what a miracle actually is, and what, what is the correct definition. And I'm actually working on that now for my PhD. I think I've come up with a very comprehensive treatment of miracles. But essentially, a miracle is supposed to be an unlikely event. It, if you see somebody walking on the ground, you don't immediately fall to your knees and worship that person. There's nothing, there's nothing special about someone walking on the ground, but you take the same person, make them walk on water, now you've got a Messiah. Because walking on water is, is generally not possible. 
So the whole point of a miracle and its power in convincing people, its power of getting people to convert, is that it is an unlikely event. Now, the extreme unlikeliness of a miracle, when you plug the, the figures into Bayes' theorem, must be overcome by extremely good evidence. Of course, when it comes to the biblical Jesus, we have a bunch of um, you know, interaligned anonymous texts by non-eyewitnesses from after the fact. Now, this, of course, does not make good evidence. The sources also that we have are not disinterested. They're actually actively pushing their belief. They're showing no skepticism. They're not talking about their methods. They're not mentioning their sources. They don't even tell us who they are. So it's uh, the sources we have, the evidence we have for the biblical Jesus, and this can also apply to God, is actually very poor. Now, given that Bayesian reasoning, how I've uh, described it, basically is the formal proof for the, the famous claim, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and that we don't have extraordinary evidence to overcome the low prior probabilities of these sorts of claims, it becomes quite obvious that the... Um, the uh, probability that that claim is true is actually very low. And that's mm -hmm. not to say that uh, this alludes to an objective truth. The beauty of Bayesian reasoning is that we're, we're working with the knowledge that we currently have. We can't work with knowledge we don't have. But based on what we know about the world right now, this is, this is the perfect way to approach questions. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, it to me is... I can't believe no one has stumbled on it before. It's just, it's so powerful to me that, that it works. And when, and yeah. to get into, into the geek math speak, once you wash the priors, wash out the priors, <laughs> it's, it's really easy to kind of demonstrate that exactly where it is. But yeah. let's go on because I think we're going to have some callers. I just got one more question. Yeah, go um, ahead. Unless you had anything else on that. Um, yeah, I, I would just like to say that um, Bayesian reasoning is fantastic, and I think I'm doing some important work in promoting it, and Carrier also has done some great work in promoting it. But it, it's not as if we've invented it. It has been around for a, a number of centuries. Yep. It's basically how scientists approach uh, questions. It's basically how science is done. And uh, there have been people that argued for the use of Bayesian reasoning in history. A lot of historians do it whether they know it or not. And I'd also like to mention that even, uh, and this is a bit, perhaps a bit ironic, even Christian apologists have been using um, Bayes' theorem for quite some time. For example, Richard Swinburne uses it to try and prove that Jesus' resurrection uh, yeah, happened. I totally forgot about that. You're right. Yeah, and so do the McGrews, who, um, Timothy McGrew, Lydia McGrew, who uh, William Lane Craig are, are well aware of. And they actually try and use Bayes' theorem to prove the resurrection of Jesus. I actually um, investigate such claims and find that what they're doing, I mean, it, it's not really Bayesian reasoning because they're not factoring in all the evidence. They're, okay. they're um, giving too much respect to the Gospels as well. I mean, in, uh, in Timothy McGrew's article on Jesus' resurrection, he basically admits that he's pretty much assuming the Gospels are true, which, you know, if that's the case, why do you need a formula to prove that the resurrection happened? You can just say, well, the Gospels tell <laughs> the truth. Yeah. That um, that actually that actually is a great segue. You didn't even know it, but wow. <laughs> into yeah. my last question. Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, sure, what, sure. Yeah, what what I was going to say is is um, how do you defend against the theists claiming that the values that are plugged into base theorem, if they are using the you know the the math, I can see some of them saying they're erroneous due to bias on yeah. the part of the historians, and it, yeah. if there's bias there, those initial values are invalid, then that would invalidate the, in, the entire argument. Um, you know, the, the example I would give is that, you know, I could see a theist, especially literalists, claiming that Bayes' theorem, like you were saying, actually proves the Bible, because yeah. if we know that everything that was stated in the Bible is, by definition, inerrant, we <laughs> know with 100% certainty that it happened, so you put that on the A side, and you put zero much there. I mean, you, you have to conclude that it, you know, it was, um, sure. you know, and like William Lane Craig, I mean, I think we all could agree that a literalist doing that would be pretty much laughed out of the room. But yeah, where I think, yeah. where I think it could get kind of interesting is someone like we were mentioned earlier, William Lane Craig, um, bringing in his quote unquote own experts that would plug yeah. in, well, effectively, uh, flipping the numbers, and yeah. then your probability 
on the end would come out inverted. It would come out to demonstrate that there's a more likelihood. How do you address that? Yeah, I um, I get the really annoying charge a lot from evangelical scholars. I've uh, recently been involved in an online discussion with Mike Lacona's son-in-law and some of his his uh, colleagues, and I often get accused of assuming that there is no God, assuming that miracles can't happen and that they don't happen, and therefore that when I'm judging a miraculous claim using Bayesian reasoning, I'm not being unbiased. And, and that is just ridiculous. I don't assume these things at all. I even show that if we assume these things, if we assume God's existence, if we assume that miracles um, can happen and do happen, and to, to the extreme, even if we assume that a resurrection has happened, I'm still very much justified in saying that a miraculous claim uh, by its own nature is inherently implausible. So even if the claim is true, we don't really have good reason to believe that it's true unless we have that great evidence. And of course, when it comes to uh, basically all of these religious claims, we don't have great evidence. <laughs> we have sources that, as I said, are, are really poor, they're anonymous, they're generally looked at with methods uh, that are also um, quite poor. And yeah, there's a lot of evangelicals that try and use Bayes' theorem to prove aspects of their faith, but they're overestimating the evidence. You mentioned that you know they might say the Bible is infallible. That's, that's begging the question. We've got a lot of evidence that the Bible is not infallible. If you're going to go down that path, yeah, you know, I mean, it's easy to point out there are different translations, there are different versions of the Bible. The Bible has been chopped and changed for the last thousands, uh, couple of thousand years. It's it's just a ridiculous claim, biblical inerrancy. No serious scholar um, holds to that. And um, such such evangelical scholars also fail to consider the alternative explanations as well when they're doing their Bayesian calculations. And one obvious alternative explanation is total fabrication. So once again, getting sort of towards that Jesus uh, mythicist idea is that, you know, this, this could have all just been made up. And this gets back to that old Humean argument that it is so easy to just make up a miraculous claim. It's obviously not so easy to actually perform a miracle. So uh, it's actually those scholars that are, are being biased in the figures they use and not the more skeptical scholars such as myself. Yep, that, yeah. I, I absolutely agree. That's, that is... Could I just uh, quickly add that yeah, that's uh, Bayes' theorem is like all great formulas. It's subject to the GIGO principle, garbage in, garbage out. Yep. <laughs> you got it. Absolutely. So that's all I've got. Um, cool. Joe, you, do you have a few? Yeah, I got a few here. Uh, we'll get over them. Uh, we'll go over them, I should say. Not get over them, but we'll go over them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, see, you see, I'm trying to think ahead of myself, trying to get to the next segment. But no, I want to spend as much time with you as possible, of course. And uh, I think these couple yes. questions we have are, uh, I think people are going to really like. So, uh, Negation, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, guys, remember, there's going to be a call-in section or a session. Segment? Are you there? Sure. In now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just let you guys know, uh, you guys could uh, add me as a contact request or send a contact re request to Live Life 8072. And it's spelled like this. You guys should all know it. Live Life 8072 right there. That's the contact request if you want to be part of the show on our, well, in our uh, call in segment. I already have one person lined up. Uh, actually, they're actually from Australia, which is pretty cool, I think. And uh, we'll get to him in a little bit here. But uh, real quick, I got a couple questions for you, um, Raphael. Is um, <clears throat> what's your uh, friendliness towards, like, say, uh, religion or religious people in general? Yeah, um, this is very interesting. I'm a religious studies scholar, and uh, it's pretty much. It's pretty much part of the job to uh, to be pro-religious to some to some extent, and it's important to consider what actually is religion. There's a lot more to religion than just Christianity or making exclusivist claims. There's a lot of religions that are quite benign uh, when it comes to truth claims, such as Buddhism or Taoism, even some versions of of Christianity. And uh, in my book, there was no Jesus, there is no God. And in my research, uh, I make the case that I'm not being anti-religious at all. I'm I am merely looking at the evidence from a non-biased uh, standpoint. It's not even anti-Christian really because a lot of people are Christians not because of the evidence but because of faith. And uh, if, there is, if there is something I'm anti about, it's really anti-exclusivism. It's exclusivism mm -hmm. that I'm not a fan of and that is basically the idea that 
you know, one person's religion is, is correct, their, their view is correct, and everyone else is wrong. Every other religion is from the devil, for example. And I guess that means I'm anti-fundamentalist as well. But uh, anti-religion, no, it doesn't make sense to be anti-religious. Uh, it makes sense to really get in there and find out um, what it is that you have something against. And for me, that's exclusivism. I'm not a big fan of religious exclusivism. Uh, between me and you, I respect your viewpoint, but I would have to disagree with that. <laughs> but that's just me. <laughs> sure. And this this segment's about you. But uh, yeah, no, I, I agree to a certain point on that perspective. There's no doubt. Uh, you yep. know, in my case, real quick, I'll say is uh, I, I think religion hinders the advancements of certain societies, and that's just me. I, everything you said so far, I could see your viewpoint. I totally agree with actually a lot of it, most of it actually. And uh, but on that point, I would say yeah, I, I think there's a problem when it comes to religion, and you know, I respect people with the religious view; they have their rights. But I think when it comes to religion in general, when it's pushed into societies, at least my viewpoint is just that. So I'll just leave it there. You can re you can go on top of that if you wish, and or I can get to next question well there are um, there are religions to uh, to which orthodoxy isn't so important they're more about orthopraxy so they don't care so much what you believe uh, they care more about rituals now these such, such as yeah. another pagan religion so these religions don't really try and stop the pursuit of science so uh, what you've just said is definitely right for a number of religions but it's not right of all religions so that's Oh, I totally Basically, agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. What yeah. I'm trying to say is that not all religions are necessarily bad. No, I, basically, what I was basically saying that, which I should have clarified, was basically the three what we would call monotheistic religions, if we want to call them. Yeah, that. we have we have complete agreement there. <laughs> okay, so good, we're we're agreement. Good, awesome, <laughs> clarity. <laughs> so, uh, it, the next question I really got to ask you is, what's your official stance regarding like uh, the Jesus uh, mythicism theory? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great question, especially considering the uh, provocative title of my book. <laughs> it's a very good question. I don't actually uh, assert that there definitely was no Jesus. And thank you also for mentioning Jesus mythicism rather than Christ mythicism. Yes. One thing I'm trying to do is get people away from this term Christ myth theory, and hopefully people can use Jesus myth theory, because we all agree that Christ was a myth, the critical scholars, the everyday atheists. What we're also looking at is whether Jesus was a myth. So that's, uh, I think, a much better term. But I don't, I don't say that it's not possible that Jesus didn't exist or that, uh, that it's impossible that he existed. I just basically argue that it's not crazy to question it. It is indeed possible that, hey, maybe this, this guy just didn't exist. And beyond that, well, I Raphael, actually... Could I, could I just yeah? interject something based on the point you yeah. just made um, yeah. about differentiating between Jesus and Christ? Yes. Um, one one thing that I'm hearing more and more, especially from Muslims, um, is the use of the term God. Mm -hmm. um, they they believe in Allah, and yet more and more in dialogue with with atheists and Christians, they're reverting to saying God instead of Allah. The same goes for for Jesus and Christ. Jesus himself, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth may have existed. Christ almost absolutely did not. Um, and, and yet, if you, you know, that, those sort of things have to be clarified. What do you mean by God? Do you mean Allah? Do you mean Yahweh? Those things need to be clarified as well, because if it all just gets lumped into one big God concept, then, you know, something is lost, because everyone has their own concept of what those words mean. And if you mm -hmm. don't clear, clarify that there is a difference between Christ and Jesus, then, then people just, they don't hear half of what you're saying. Uh, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, that is exactly right. That's actually a very important theme in my uh, doctoral work as well, is in clarifying what it is that people are saying. It's very interesting that I think in, uh, in maybe about half of the arguments of William Lane Craig is committing the fallacy of ambiguity. He's using a word uh, differently in different premises and in the conclusion as well than how he used it in uh, another part of the argument. So it is very important to clarify what it is exactly we're talking about. No, definitely well said. Uh, anything else that you have to, uh, you know, maybe, maybe answer on that question or are you okay yeah, with that? Yeah, as for the Jesus myth theory, uh, I do think personally that it is more probable that Jesus didn't exist or not, and that is because there's a lot of disagreement from the sources on when he was born, when he died. I think it's a bit more plausible that he did exist if there was agreement on such such important uh, and fundamental matters. But nothing I do in my research relies on the notion that Jesus did not exist as a historical person, and atheism also doesn't rely on that. And I think that's, that's part of the reason why atheists are actually 
not only Christians, of course, but, but even atheists are often against the idea of Jesus not existing historically because they see it as a battle that doesn't need to be waged. You know, we can focus on the biblical Jesus, the guy that walked on water and performed miracles and was raised from the dead. We don't need to talk about whether there was an actual person named Jesus walking around in first century Palestine. There's nothing wrong with that concept. Yeah, we usually I basically think, we basically attack uh, the suspensions of the natural order, I should say, right? So <laughs> Exactly, yeah. And that, that's probably where most of the focus should actually be on. It's interesting that in my book, I've actually softened um, softened what I say about Jesus compared to my thesis, which which was definitely about whether Jesus existed or not, because I and that's an admission from me that this issue is not is not crucial to atheism. It's just an interesting historical question whether he actually existed or not. And of course, if you could prove that Jesus did not exist as a historical person, which I think you can't do anyway, but if you could, that would that would obviously make the job for uh, non Christians a lot easier. Obviously, they couldn't have been the biblical Jesus either, if the historical Jesus didn't exist. Now, let me ask you a quick question. This is uh, it's just an additional question I just came up with, just hearing you real quick, if we could get to this, yep. since we have a little time. Is, is uh, w Now, would the burden of proof of Jesus be on the religious people or, or historians to prove Jesus, or do we have actually documented documentation, I should say, it's not even a fucking real word, document, documentation on um, maybe some kind of evidence that Jesus ever existed? Are you asking about what sources we have for Jesus? Sources, yeah. Okay, sure. Well, that is uh, that is the big problem when it comes to both the biblical Jesus and the historical Jesus. Correct. In that we don't have uh, any physical sources. They're all textual sources. Now, okay. these these texts, these documents, such as the Gospels, are um, are written at least decades after the fact. Uh, a lot of them, at least a century after the fact. And the copies we have generally are from the medieval times. So a lot has been, can and has been changed during that time. And none of the sources we have are actually written by eyewitnesses. Yeah. None of the sources we have are contemporary from the time of Jesus or from, from Jesus' own hand. Uh, these sources are really poor. And when it comes to separating the sources for the so-called historical Jesus and the sources for the biblical Jesus, we can't actually do that. It are the same sources. And that's the problem. That's, that's one of the reasons I think it's quite rational to question whether there was a historical Jesus, because it's not as if we have some sources from Jesus' time that just mentions him as an insignificant preacher that had no, mathical, uh, no, no magical powers. All the sources we have for Jesus, uh, the early sources, they all portray him as this magical character. We don't actually have separate early sources for the so-called historical Jesus. So I think that's a big problem for, for both concepts of Jesus. Wow, well said, yeah. Yeah, I see your point on that. And you basically have a similar approach as David Fitzgerald, which was on the show uh, probably like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. So yeah, sort of a similar yeah, approach. David's yeah, David's been a, uh, a great influence um, on you. A great support for me. He uh, he's support. partly the reason why I chose this topic for the master's thesis. <laughs> nice, <laughs> that's great. So I got two more quick questions, and they're basically in cahoots together. So they're basically uh, about the same topic. Uh, yep. what, what's your current research that you are currently doing? I should ask. Yeah, so um, mostly I'm focusing on my PhD at the moment. Of course, I've uh, been working in a book which is related and, and trying to get the word out for the book. The book's been doing really well as well. I think it's only uh, Richard Dawkins has been the only author to keep me from first position on the uh, Amazon Atheist chart. But uh, mainly I'm working on the PhD at, uh, at present, and that's focusing on Craig's arguments for God, such as uh, his famous Kalam cosmological argument, his moral argument, fine-tuning argument, ontological argument, and, and his Jesus resurrection argument. So I'm doing a lot of work um, in uh, basically refuting these arguments, pointing out there's, there's many problems with them at, at low levels and high levels. I'm also looking into Craig's sociological impact um, which uh, which alludes to the fact that I even had trouble starting this project. I had trouble starting my master's project, but I also had a bit of trouble starting the PhD project because some people, some scholars think, uh, why would you talk about Craig? He's insignificant. <laughs> His arguments are obviously not so good, but um, he is a very influential person, and I think that alone makes, him, uh, makes him worth discussing. So that's why I've, I've uh, also put a sociological aspect to my work on Craig, and I also look at uh, at pantheism in uh, a little bit with a PhD, but also in some side articles. I'm uh, I'm quite interested in how um, 
in how apologists deal with the problem of pantheism. I understand that with Craig, for example, he barely mentions it. No one's really come up with a good argument. No monotheist, I should say, has come up with a good argument against pantheism and why their arguments can't actually apply to pantheism as well. No, well said. On, on top of that, with William Lane Craig, and basically what I want to get into is, uh, if you would call this your current project, is uh, I guess uh, you know that maybe I, I guess I have read between the lines there like some kind of Christian bias in academia. Like, yeah. uh, what are the challenges <laughs> that you face, you know, with that project? Yeah, I yeah. Well, project? Um, I did have challenges in starting my master's project. I um, I was encouraged by a few people to um, you know within within the university to look at other questions, maybe related questions, but really other questions. It seems that they did not want me looking into it. And uh, the, uh, the, bizarre, the bizarre thing there is that I didn't reveal what my conclusion would be. In fact, I did not know what my conclusion would be. If you know what your conclusion is, is that really objective scholarly research. But uh, I didn't know what the conclusion would be, and yet they still didn't want me looking into the question. But I had another scholar step in and, and really encourage me and support me, and I ended up I ended up doing the master's thesis on Jesus' historicity, and uh, it, it turned out to be uh, a very good thesis that was uh, very, um, very well accepted. And um, yeah, there is, I think, obviously there's a, a religious bias when it comes to theology. Also, biblical studies is not supposed to be uh, religiously biased. It's meant to be critical of, uh, of the Bible, but there's still a lot of bias, I mean, because you have to imagine who are the people that will spend their whole professional careers around the Bible. It's probably going to be a Christian, and it's it's no um, it's no secret that most biblical scholars are indeed Christians, and it would be a hard ask um, to 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 imagine that they put away all their personal beliefs in the very text that they're studying when they do their professional research. And uh, I understand that that is a challenge for them. But uh, religious studies, the field that I'm in, uh, is, is meant to be even more obviously um, uh, objective and, uh, and more of the outside of view. And often they look at other topics rather than Christianity, but I'm, I'm choosing to look at Christianity. And um, when it comes to religious studies as a whole, a few people from, from within, a few religious scholars, have often uh, asked or dealt with the question, you know, is religious studies also uh, does, does religious studies also have a pro-Christian agenda? And I've got a little uh, a little article on the, on the Religious Studies Project website about that, if you want to look it up. That was a response to uh, a scholar named Jack Sonis who interviewed uh, Professor Dale Martin, who's a Christian scholar. And Martin basically admitted, yeah, there is a bit of a Christian bias there. Yeah, if you want to give me that link later on after the show, that'd be great. And I can add that link to the description box of this video. So that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. People will probably be asking for that link uh, in the comment section if I don't add it. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, you can also get it from my uh, Pantheism Unites website oh, under the great, yeah. scholarly, scholarly Publications page. Which, which that's we're, the first we're, one that comes up. Which I want to really talk about is your scholarly publications real quick. Is there a Christian yeah. agenda behind Religious Studies Departments, January 2013? You also have that's Bayesian... Yeah. And your next one here says Bayesian reason criticizing the criteria of authentic authenticity <laughs> and calling for a review of biblical criticism, May 2013. And you also have one here, New Atheist, New Atheist and New Theologians, uh, June 2013, yeah. which is pretty cool. And then you got two that looks like they're coming in uh, some kind of publication soon, or three of them. Uh, Why I Ought to Debate with William Lane Craig, September 2013, comes soon, published by the AFA. A philosophical and historical analysis of William Lane Craig's resurrection of Jesus' argument being published and pantheism being published. So, yeah, it's, that's great. And I'll add all that information in the description box and, of course, forward people to your websites and stuff like that. So, thank you. I'd like yeah. you to make one point. Um, sure, we could do, we could do a wrap up here, Matthew, with, negation and mega. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make one very quick point about the historicity of Jesus. Um, it seems to be uh, an, uh, an argument that a lot of atheists and non-believers are avoiding questioning yeah. that because there is sort of a consensus in the uh, historical community r related to Jesus. Um, because so you know, there's so much of a consensus that he did most likely exist. Um, a lot of atheists and non-believers are avoiding the topic. They're saying that they don't even want to bring it up and talk about it as a possibility, but it, it is still a possibility. It's something that should be looked at. 
Yeah, that's um, that's very true. And um, basically, my my thesis is all about um, showing why that consensus should be questioned. Uh, right. Obviously, most most scholars, whether you call them historians or not, they they essentially are biblical scholars. I mean, the the people that uh, put their whole uh, focus on the Bible, whether they're actually biblical scholars or historians, they generally tend to be Christian, so already their motives can be questioned. But there's also um, atheistic scholars like Bart Ehrman that also assert, you know, you can't say, well, they're biased towards Christianity because they believe in it. Um, they also assert that it definitely was a historical Jesus. But there's another aspect to this, and it, it's... Uh, it's interesting if you look at uh, Hector Avalos' stance on the issue, he's got a great book about this called uh, The End of Biblical Studies. Basically, he shows that even those who, who study the Bible professionally who aren't believers, they still have good reason to be biased towards a historical Jesus because their, their salaries basically depend on it. Like Bart Ehrman, he is uh, effectively funded by Christians. So whether you... Um, whether you are a believer or you're funded by a believer, I think there's something there that says, yeah, we should probably promote the idea that this guy definitely existed. Yeah, no, I, I see your point, no doubt. Uh, Matthew, anything else? And we'll move to negation and we'll get to our live call segment. Nope, that's it. Uh, negation? No, all I wanted to point out was, if I correct me if I'm wrong, Raphael, wasn't your master's thesis the first in a major university that was accepted along these lines? It seems it seems that it is, at least in modern times, that, yeah, it is the first time a world-class university has um, has passed a thesis that is sympathetic to these views, yeah. That's outstanding. Congrats on that, man. That's all I have. Thank you. I like to see it as a... Uh, a sort of a pointer towards um, towards further work to come. Obviously, Richard Carey is working on uh, arguing against Jesus' existence as well. I think it's important to uh, start with the basis that it's not crazy to ask the question. Uh, we, we definitely yeah. hope so. <laughs> That's great. Uh, guys, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Raphael, would you like to stay around? Because I think I have a, a, a caller I just added to Skype that I think wants to ask you a couple questions. Would you like to stay, stay around for our live call segment? I think negation is going to be taking questions from the audience. Would you like to stay around? Sure. Could I awesome. quickly um, sure. end, uh, end this piece with something about uh, a topical issue? You mentioned earlier in the show the, the issue of gay marriage. Yeah, sure. You can, you can close it out uh, on this segment and we can get to the call-in segment. Sure, absolutely. Cool. Go ahead. And, and, and it's rude of me for even uh, not even uh, proposing it to you, so I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. But uh, I wanted to quickly mention a brief article. I think you should check it out. It's only about three or four paragraphs which I put on the site, it's called Faith vs. Evidence, Why Religious Tolerance Always Wins, basically discusses that the lack of evidence uh, for any particular religion means that um, the believer should basically rely on faith, which I think is okay as long as there's that, uh, that humility, as long as there's no exclusivism there. And I conclude the article with a bit of a punchline about gay marriage. Um, so the end of the article is basically this. Uh, believe as you wish, but until you have the evidence to justify that your view is true and all other views are false, you should not live as if your view is true and all other views are false. We should all humbly acknowledge and respect each other's religious and non-religious views. So let the gays get married. Well said. That's good. Well said. That's very good. All right. So what we're going to do here, uh, Raphael, uh, oh shit, well, I just hit my microphone. But uh, no, thank you. I'm like, this was a great, and I, I will be watching this video again because I'm doing a little technical background stuff as you were talking, and I apologize for that, but I definitely will be listening to the segment more closely. But uh, no, I, I think what I've heard so far, I, I definitely, we, we appreciate your opinion, this and that, and the factual uh, research that you do, I should say. And uh, yeah, I will be definitely uh, uh, buying your book. There's no doubt I will be buying it. I will be looking into uh uh, the claims and i i'm just so excited i'm like i just got uh two books from david fitzgerald i got ha halfway through the wine and i'm looking forward to get yours and after i'm done his i'm gonna get on yours and i might actually make a video on my personal youtube channel you know i almost got three thousand subscribers over there so maybe i can help cool. you out with you know having some people purchase yeah, your books i did it for david it. love to get the word out there yeah i did it for uh, david so i'll do it for you yeah book. yeah reviews are welcome too on amazon no, yeah, absolutely. You can, you can buy the Amazon God, this and that, guys, uh, this and that. So it, the, the name of the book is There Was No Jesus, There Was No God. So please, guys, go support uh, Raphael. Go purchase the book and uh, 
Yeah, I mean, they got all this. You know, I'll put everything in the description box on the video. So, yes. and real quick, guys, his website is pantheismunites.org and also rafaelletaster.com. So uh, that will also be in the description box. So, uh, negation. What else you guys see real quick before we get in a live call? Yeah, I just want I want everybody to know that he's basically giving the book away on Amazon, guys. It's only three dollars if I remember. Yeah, right. Kindle is only like three bucks, two ninety nine, yeah, right? So, guys, so, yeah. and even the hardback <laughs> is only eight. So. Yeah. So. It's worth the. It's definitely worth the money. Oh yeah, and support, uh, support, support our guests, man. You guys love the Skeptic Fen Show. We've been doing this for almost two years now. So come on, support, support the people. And I know you guys support Dave Fitzgerald. So let's go. Thank you, Gray Matter, for doing that. What a nice guy. Look at, look how nice our. Uh our 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 guest or or I should say our sub subscribers they just copy the link and post it man that's that's great as shit so let's take a real quick break here I'm thinking about ten different things at one time here because I got so many people that want to uh, call in I think but let me get to this and let's take a little break we'll get to our live calling segment guys so we'll be right back all right hang in there. <laughs> All right, guys, live calling segment. Aussie Soda, if I may call you that. Are you there? Yep. So what's going on? You sound a little low. Can you turn up the mic just a little bit if you can? And what questions do you have for the panel here? Uh, I'd like to know your opinion on the fact that God and Jesus... And all the people who think that this is a test would like violate the second commandment or something like that? I don't know what you're saying. What's your question? Like, wouldn't believing in Jesus violate the second commandment? Why would what? Would, wouldn't I, live like, I, I think I understand what you're asking. You're, you're, you're saying, yeah. you know, that thou shalt not have any other gods before me, right? right? Yes. Well, that's that's the problem there is that there's no consensus in Christianity whether or not Jesus is God or Jesus is, you know, a reincarnation, if you will, of God. There's no consensus, so it's, you know, if you are to say that, that Jesus is a different entity than God as a member of the Trinity, then, uh, you know, in a way... Trinity, yeah. I mean, unless you, you are saying that they're the same and then they're not the same, which is argued sometimes, there's there's not really any way to get around that, except maybe keeping it murky as much as possible. But most Christians, in my experience, do still consider Jesus as the same God as the Old Testament God. Yeah, all right. So it's not really worshiping a different God. Yeah, okay, thanks, I guess. <laughs> Any, any other questions or no? Uh, not really. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for coming on, and we do appreciate your question, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. You're, well, you're welcome. Raphael, do you have anything to add to that? He's, he's on this. He's on the show, so he, he'll be able to hear Raphael. Raphael, you got anything to add on that? I think uh, basically Matthew Matthew had the right of it. It's um, most Christians, I think, would see Jesus as the same God of the Old Testament that gave that commandment, so uh, there wouldn't necessarily be a contradiction there. On that, I think it's very difficult to point out that there are actual contradictions in the Bible because the Bible can be so ambiguous. So when you're talking about Hebrew and Aramaic, which is supposed to be the language of Jesus, uh, you're talking about very ambiguous, uh, poetic even, languages. So you can, you can really twist the Bible to mean whatever you want it to be, so it, it can be quite easy to actually avoid a contradiction. No, no, I totally agree with that. There's no doubt. And 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 when you propose the contradictions, or you should have contradictions, which basically uh, it depends. If, well, whatever translation you go by, uh, yeah, you, you, you know what I mean. It's like you go back to Aramaic or whatever. Just they they did just tra in Hebrew. It just you could just go all the way back to the Torah and just uh, okay. Well, what's right? Why is there thirty some odd editions of the Bible? And you could you could look into it. And you could go from you know King James to uh, NIV, and you could just go. And you just see they're different. They're totally the contexts are totally different on in, in many, <laughs> a lot of uh, you know a scripture. You know you just go over it. You know what I mean? You know you go to the one. I, th I forget what it is, what uh, scripture it is, but uh, they they basically talk about a male and breast milk. You know stuff, like, and it says nourishment. And then you just you you go back to like certain you know, and you can compare the you can, well. Who, if this if this piece of literature is so objectively moral like they claim it why why 
<laughs> what is so objectively correct about it? Please, please explain the thousands of discrepancies and contradictions in the Bible. Please explain these because I haven't found anybody that really can just really go over every single contradiction, discrepancy that, you know, people have, historians and, and us alike, you know. I haven't seen it yet. If you want to see if you want to see just how objective <clears throat> the Bible is, go into a a message board or a chat room full of Christians and ask them whether or not the Trinity is three separate gods or only one God. And, and they'll contradict each other, yeah. Watch, watch the fun. <laughs> no, you're right. And that, that's the funny part about it. And the, these people that are just so adamant about being just a very religious person, that's fine. You know, I respect people's religion. That's fine for themselves, but not when it's pushed into society, education, laws, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, and, and that, that's the sad part about it, man. It's like they, they always have an excuse for anything you, you, you propose to them or ask them about. Always. Oh, yeah. oh, well, you know, no, come on, man. No, we're trying to be serious here. Yeah, I, I can see when it comes to the morality issue, when it comes to Jesus. Yeah, well, okay, well, if you want to teach your kids the morality of Jesus, okay, I'm fine with that. But we don't need Jesus for that. We we don't need Jesus to teach our kids that same type of morality. Because before any monotheistic religion or religion in general ever existed, we I, I think deep down inside... For our species to advance over the last 100,000 years, our species currently, I, I think we need to have some kind of uh, skepticism. We, 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 we had some kind of innate morality inborn to us. So I, I'm like, that's why I push on these people. Like, well, what about before us? The evidence that we have of how we evolved. What happened from there to there? And where was God to play in our evolution? And you ask these people this, and they just turn a blind eye. They don't want to answer it. And it just makes me sick. Yeah. It's an interesting point that you raised, if I can quickly, uh, sure. quickly add to that, about um, morality in the, in the Bible. A lot of the, the morality of Jesus you can trace back to Buddhism and Taoism. Correct, yeah. And uh, there's a lot of things in the Bible that we, we generally wouldn't see as being particularly immoral today, such as when David wanted to buy King Saul's uh, daughter, I believe it was, he was asked to uh, present King Saul with a hundred foreskins. Now, David, obviously, being such a moral person, wouldn't do such a thing. So he actually showed up with 200 foreskins. Yeah, and that's always excellent. You know what I mean? It's just like, uh, yeah. What, what, the funny thing is about, like, uh, to go on top of that is, like, not what you said, but think about who would take the time to cut off penises or <laughs> cut off the foreskin of penises to prove a, a point, to prove a point, not like chop off a finger or heads or something like that grotesque but or i should say just as grotesque as that is be cut off penises and foreskins to to prove that you killed 200 people are are you i mean how, what what if that happened in today's society you know say we go to war you know over over in iraq say we we were cut off friggin you know uh, the iraqis friggin penises uh, what how would society react to that and you try to propose these questions to the Christians. Oh, well, that was back in the day. That was back in the era where, you know, they, he had, get the fuck out of here, man. That's why I believe people, I'm like, that's fine. You, you want to have your religion, you, you have the right to. I totally respect that, but I will not respect to being pushed and indoctrination or indoctrinating kids in, in education, so on and so forth. I will not put up with that. I will fight against that. And that's what my personal challenge is about. So, uh, uh, Negation or Matthew, you got anything to say on what we were just uh, chatting about right now? No, I'm, I'm curious if we have any other callers. Uh, no, I'm like, two just dropped out. I'm like, they're not on. I, I just been messaging them. They're, they just dropped out. So um, couple, I don't know who they I've were. I've got a couple of questions from the, from the chat. From the chat. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Um, the first one um, is for Raphael, and I believe all of them are, actually. Um, it's from Don't Bug It. And it, I think we've piqued his interest in Bayes, and what he wanted to know is, is, what would be the best way to go about learning more about Bayes' theorem and Bayesian reasoning? Right. Well, <clears throat> you can uh, check out my article uh, that uh, Joe mentioned earlier on, on Bayesian reasoning. That uh, is open access, so it's, it's a rare case, or, or fairly rare case, where you can actually look at a scholarly article that is, um, is available for free. So that's on, uh, that's on the website. And, Very good. Uh, if if you want a more in-depth treatment, and especially to look into the mathematics of it, I, uh, I definitely recommend Richard Carrier's Proving History. Uh, it's, um, there's not too much in there about Jesus' uh, mythicism, 
So if you're interested in Bayes, it's basically all about Bayes' theorem and uh, what, a, what a fantastic tool it is to use in history and also in biblical studies. Yeah, good. And uh, I kind of pointed him, if, if you do have the chance, most just one of the I think, uh, I think a few people so got that. If you have a chance to go and take some statistics, they'll they'll definitely go over base there. Um, Matthew, do you have something? Oh no, I, I got cut out. Let's see, Joe, are you there? Uh, I'm here. Okay, well, I think uh, chat in the chat. If you can hear us, thumbs up. Anybody? <laughs> I don't I know can, if we're still. Yeah, we're good. I can hear you. I don't hear anybody else. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, was, I just I was live. wondering. If, what are you talking about? I just got Matthew, back. do you have anything to add on that, or do you want me to get to the next one? No, no, I'm, I'm fine. I, I just wanted to say thank you very okay. much to Raphael for, for his time and for you know being so uh, forthcoming with all of his his yeah. uh, his work and his ideas that you know by all rights he should be charging a lot of money for, but he's you know he's he's just telling everyone uh, he's he's very important. Uh, research topics that he's he's been working on, and everyone should go buy his book because I intend to um, as soon as my internet my internet is connected next week, that's what I'll be doing. But um, I wanted to thank him for for being so generous with his time and his work. Yeah, ah, thank you very much. And and kind of on that topic, um, we had another question. Um, just to let you know, I really did enjoy that um, that open source paper that you did, and that it was really informative and really good. Um, but to springboard on that, um, have you got anything in mind for your next book? Oh yeah, I I think the world of my current book, there was no Jesus, there is no God, but the next book I think is going to be legendary. <laughs> it's uh, it's going to. Um, <laughs> really? I think it's it's going to expand a lot more. Well, don't the, forget uh, us here, okay? Like da <laughs> like David Fitzgerald, the David Fitzgerald put us in his book, so ha ha ha, hint hint. Ah. <laughs> so what's, what's the title? If I can ask, what's the title of the next book going to be, or have you set one yet? Um, still thinking about it. The ideas that we have are uh, are pretty good, pretty provocative, but it, it's going to look into the arguments for God a bit more, and I'm going to. Um, to have a, a threefold approach to uh, to God's existence, uh, looking at it from a, a point of, as we all know, it's not been proven, but also looking into it from the perspectives of, well, it might not even be uh, plausible compared to other, to, compared to alternative God views such as pantheism, and uh, also looking into uh, to concepts about how how traditional views of God are actually impossible. So it's going to be. Uh, I think it's going to be a bigger book. It's going to look into the arguments for God in a lot more detail. So I'm very, very excited for that. The only problem is it's, it's a fair while off because it's going to be after my PhD. And the PhD is a project of about four years. So yeah. <laughs> but uh, we're going to have to enjoy my current book. Definitely. But, uh, that I, think, I think it's a great book. <laughs> no, absolutely, man. That's, that's excellent. Oh, I, man. I, so, I uh, absolutely agree. Uh, any more Especially questions? Especially for the price. I'm oh, sorry. Nothing comparable. Uh, real quick, uh, Negation, you got any, uh, any more questions? If not, we can go with closing statements and end the showdown, and we can go to the post-show. post, uh, post uh, show. Yeah, one real quick, um, just if you could briefly, go over um, if you had any religious background, um, kind of what that was. Where, where, did you, where did all this spring from? That's an excellent question. Thank you. Yeah, like uh, a lot of people, I think I uh, was in religion simply because of where I was born and, and to which, which parents I was born to. I think that's a very common, uh, common theme when it comes to religion and fundamentalism. And uh, basically, I grew up in a, in a Christian family. And that, uh, that um, became very painful as I became an evidentialist, as I became someone that was very interested in um, in evidence, which is perhaps ironically linked to my uh, university education, I was involved heavily in science, pharmacy, health science, that sort of thing. I, uh, I started putting more focus on the evidence, and I thought the evidence for Christianity was good, but as I looked into it, I realized that the evidence is really poor, so I, I made the very painful choice and the very honest choice to say, well, 
I don't have great evidence for my religion, and uh, at least when it comes to uh, to other religions and putting them down. So I think the best, the most rational choice is just to to leave the religion. Wow, yeah, that, that's the thing that I that I was lucky enough to kind of get out of it fairly young, so it didn't take a lot of. I get it wasn't that painful for me, so I I really do admire people who have the honesty to go through that type of pain. So, yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like... Uh, oh, God, I think we're a little bit over, so, yeah, we probably... Yeah, no, we're good, man. We're just basically right on. we got about a couple minutes to end the show, and, uh, yeah, I, I think we'll do it here because... Uh, Raphael, man, uh, uh, thank you very much, man. It's uh, very entertaining, and I, I do look forward to uh, spending a little bit more, and I apologize for that, a little bit more concentration on what you said because I'm the main guy that does all the background technical stuff and I shouldn't really have to explain that on live air which I might edit this out but no I I will be looking <laughs> into it and I will be uh, definitely pur purchasing your book and promoting your book also on the show and uh, like I did with David Fitzgerald because that's what this show is about it's about giving people alternatives or not alternatives but people uh, what we try to do here is, is promote skepticism you know people make people think and look at the evidence and, and, and the facts and that, that's what the show is basically wrapped around and and we're going to be getting away from the religious topic a little bit and get into other, I guess you could say, uh, a more, uh, I should say, uh, negation, help me out here, more more topics that are more controversial that we can really get into, like politics, not too much, but also like, let's say, say the Bigfoot, you know, like Bigfoot, we might get into something like that. We might get people in there that actually believe in Bigfoot, shit like that. So, and, uh, you know, uh, people that believe in Planet X or Nibiru. So we're going to be going into those types of things, like conspiracy theories, you know what I mean? And get those people on, you know, and stuff like that. So we're going to expand our our horizon here. And that's that's what our main goal is, or at least I should say our near future goal is. So, uh, guys, you can check out Raphael Letaster at www.pantheismunites.org and also rafaelletaster.com. They will be in the description box below when this video is published on our YouTube channel, which is Skeptic Fence. Uh, user Skeptic Fence Show.com. That will also be. Actually, you know what? Hell. Guys, right down below if you're on uh, Vaughn Live. All the links that pertain to the show are right down below. So, uh, yeah, right below where you're, where you're watching, go, go to the description box and just uh, subscribe to all those links down down below. So, uh, guys, uh, we're going to be having a post um, show here with uh, Cocktopus Prime. He's going to be showing up here in a little bit. And uh, I want to get a couple closing or a closing statement from each of my uh, guests here, Negation of P, Ned, and also Matthew Steele. But before we do that, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to, of course, Ned and Matthew, uh, my host here, and also Taldega Tom, which moderates our forums on um, Skeptic Fence uh, forums, I should say, and, and TJ, Cocktopus Prime, for uh, doing the Cuda Report this week, and he's our uh, permanent guy for the Cuda Report, and uh, guys, you're going to enjoy that every week uh, you know, with TJ. So it's going to be awesome. So, and, and most importantly, guys, it's you, the viewers, the supporters for the show that we have to, you know, you guys are the forefront. You guys are ahead of us. So you guys are the people that we put trust into to promote the show and get the word out. And that's what it's about, guys. It's about you guys. And when we come out with merchandise and stuff like that, uh, we're going to give you guys a huge discount. And we're just going to do it straight at cost. We're not going to make a penny on it. We just want to promote the show and stuff like that. So uh, that's all I have to say on my part for closing. And so we'll go with uh, Matthew, and then we'll go with Negation to end the show. Uh, I'd, rather than make a closing statement, I'd like to ask um, Raphael to hit on a topic that I, I noticed was very important to him in his work, and that is uh, the importance of humility. And I'd like to add that um, I'm talking about anyone's belief instead of just theistic beliefs, but any belief. Um, and the strength that, uh, of conviction that a person holds for that belief, how important it is to be humble in that belief. Raphael? Yeah, I, I, uh, I definitely think humility is important, whether you're talking about religion or, or something else, whether you're talking about politics, etc. I, uh, <clears throat> I think if you're going to, to hold a belief, it, it's best to have evidence, it's best to access the best, the best evidence, and uh, if you don't it's fine, you can hold the belief based on faith. But um, then, of course, I, I think we should definitely be humble because if we don't, if we don't have good or, or the best evidence to support our views, we're basically in the same position as everyone else. We're all the same. And um, if, if we're all believing on faith, then I think it's a requirement 
that you have to respect other people's views as well. Thank you. That's 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 what I gathered from your uh, your work, and um, I, I think that that's a very good philosophy for all of us to uh, aspire to. Yeah. And thank thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthew. You got anything else to say about the show, or? No, that's we're that's it. And thank you to everyone. And Joe, you do a great job as always. Thanks, and, man. Um, I'm sure. I'm really happy to be a, a permanent part of the show. Now. No, and we're happy to have you, man. There's no doubt. Yeah. So I'll hand it over to uh, to Ned. Go ahead, Ned. All right, thanks. Uh, just a couple of quick things. First, uh, Phil Robertson. I, I cannot uh, thank you enough for uh, pointing out Raphael and getting us in contact. Again, guys, anyone out there has an idea, please let us know. We're all. Our forums is the big place where you want to go, guys. So, Sign up again, on our forums is the big yeah. thing. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, Phil, again, thank you. We really, really appreciate it. Um, just a quick note on next week, or not next week, two weeks from now, um, the show topic is going to be Hollow Earth Theory, um, and we are going to have original footage from space brought to us by Redline, the YouTuber Redline. Uh, it's going to be a really interesting show. Uh, he based all this off of a, a guy out there, his name is Lord Stephen Christ, and yes, he does believe he is Jesus. And guess whose name is on side of that? Watch some of his stuff. Yeah, you're cutting out a little bit negation at the end. Sorry, man. I don't know if you got to talk up a little bit or not. Okay. But. All right. Now, just um, again, uh, thanks to everybody, and we'll be at the after show. Uh, Raphael, I'll give you the last word. Thanks again. Thank you very much for having me on on your show. This is actually the first podcast I've been on, so uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you again to uh, Phil Robertson for for helping arrange this, and uh, I hope you do enjoy my work. It uh, basically focuses on the evidence. There's nothing uh, there's nothing meant to be rude or anti-religious or even anti-Christian. It's just a sober look at the evidence, and hopefully by doing that and applying it to uh, whatever else we believe as well, we can all be uh, more humble and get rid of such exclusivist and intolerant attitudes. Absolutely, and uh, very well said, man. That's a great uh, closing statement, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be part of the person that actually uh, popped your cherry on your first podcast. So, <laughs> so one no one with a pretty good uh joke there but uh guys uh uh thank you very much and uh board of Bits, thank you for that uh very nice comment good show tonight smooth and professional approach we try to and that's our new thing that we're doing and thank you very much we're gonna be i spent 10 hours on graphics today no lie i swear to you and i'm not trying to get a oh good job no i i'm dedicated to this show and good job. We're, we're we're really dedicated to the show i think all the templates are just about done where i could use them week to week now so it'll be a little bit less work that i have to do now but 10 hours straight today but at least it showed and people respect that and, and actually appreciate that so i guys you it, it's you guys that's what we do it for so uh we're, we we got people in the future like lawrence kraus we're gonna have on and it just we're gonna be be moving forward with, with such amazing guests just like Raphael Latastor and david fitzgerald so guys thank you very much and we're going to see you guys at the after show right now so head over there right now we're closing the show down here in about five seconds so guys love you thank you very much and please go subscribe to our links down below so before you leave here and go to the after party please subscribe and make sure you please 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 sign up on our forums that's very important because our forums is where we're going to be picking the topics for our future shows so you guys are in charge of giving us what we want to yeah, we discuss the following week or, or the next week so please do so please please it's pretty easy we got everything i explained on the form so oh, i'm just tired i'm so stressed so let's go over and have a good time at the after party and Raphael, you're more than welcome to join us if you want to stay on skype and we'll go start a show over there if you want because i'm sure it's very early in the morning <laughs> all right everybody take care bye